Alexa. And I'll be sending out a communication just asking for some some visions, some goals, and things that we may want to collaborate together and be on the same page with. I don't think we've had a chance to really discuss the future or goals individually. So I'll be sending a communication out for that. And of course, welcome any additional feedback or suggestions. Very good. Sounds like things are well underway there. Um, if board members, if you have any specific ideas related to fundraising or, you know, vision, you know, please send those to Danielle and Dan so that they have that information going into the meeting and uh, they feel like they have, they can get as much done as they possibly can. You know, financial stress is hard on any relationship. So definitely rebuilding, bringing back the community so that we can be in a place of stability transparency, collaboration, to show the appreciation and get back to all the things we love, all the programs we love, all the staffing that we, we're such a tight community doing things for each other. So it would, it would be nice to just bring forward with that. Yes, absolutely. And <clears throat> for those uh, in the audience who are watching, we have approximately, um, we have a gap in the funding that we get from the state uh, for what they give us for each child and what it actually costs to give them a older education. And that gap is about $2,100 per student. Um, so we have to be creative about how we bridge that gap. Um, and we've not uh, had a formal kind of fundraising campaign um, in a meaningful way in a while. And it's very good that we're going to get that back underway uh, so that we can start doing what basically every other charter school uh, in the state does, which is, you know, raise somewhere between three and $500,000 extra per year uh, to help, you know, provide that full enriching curriculum um, that we want to provide, um, but that we just don't get enough money from the state to, to do it. So Danielle and Dan, thanks for spearheading getting that going. All right, and uh, on that front, Going in the, then to uh, let's invite Priscilla Garza into the meeting. We can give us uh, an update on our profit and loss and balance sheet and um, that sort of information and see how we're doing financially. Hello, everybody. Um, so I want to begin by looking at the profit and the the profit and loss. So it's item number five that was sent to the board. This is, I'm not sure if any, if anyone's going to post it on their screen or not. Yeah, I'll put it up there right Taking now. That, okay. Okay, again, this is the condensed version. Um, so for the month of December, because it is this end of the second quarter and we are still under charter intervention, meaning that we have to report our financials to the charter board every quarter. Um, the December statements accrue the payrolls back um, like we would at the end of the year. So instead of just doing it at the end of the year, we do it every quarter for those statements. So the December statements have the payroll accrued back and also the state funding accrued back so that we can get a full months or a full six month picture. Um, so in looking at it, the tuition for the first six months of the year is 13,000. Our tax credits collected is 3,900. Miscellaneous income is 43,000, and that is um, where you'll see your consumables. Um, the consumables fees collected so far this year is 29,000, and then the other 10,000 is a donation. Uh, your equalization payments from the state is 1.196, and the federal revenue is um, grants, the um, ESG grants and your IDA money for a total income so far of 1,485,000. In that money, in, as part of that money, we are spending 1.158 in regular education, 138,000 in the special education, 58,000 was the Prop 301 from the prior year, but it's expensed this year. We have $752 that we still are collecting receipts on. And so our total regular expenses is 1.356. Then when we add in our private program, 
Our private program, we're spending 33,000 when you add those two lines. Our depreciation for the first six months of the year is 75,000. So our total gain now for this first six months is 19,000. So we have a profit so far for the first six months of 19,000. Um, in saying so, I want to remind you that part of the income that's, that's posted there, part of the federal income, is the um, ESG grant. It's 125000 for the ESG grant. That's a one-time um, source of income, and that was posted in December. And then also the ESSER grant, the 50000 is also in those numbers, and that also is a one-time um, grant. So I wanted to remind you that those are one-times. Are there any questions on the profit and loss for the first six months of the year? Have we actually received the ESSER funds? Yes. Was, we did. Okay. Yes, we received them in January. I see. But they're in January of 2020? Or, uh, or just a few might days have been ago? December. I think that it was received in December right as we closed. I see. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah, it was in December. I'm sorry, because we had booked it in November. We were showing it in the Novembers, and we actually received the money in December. Got it. Okay. But that was what helped us get our bank balance where we needed it for our RSF loans. Right. Okay. So, it, it, I mean, this just kind of highlights the the issue we have in the, the gap in funding we have right now for students. Because without those two grants, um, we would be significantly in the red uh, so far this year. So getting that fundraising program up and running and explaining to people why that is so important is truly critical. Yes. All right, other questions? Yes, so this was the first six months. So coming up with the next five months, we're gonna be shy 155. Well, the fiscal ends in the fiscal year ends in June, and so it would all it would be to the next six months as well. But yes, because between the ESSER grant and the ESG grant, those two items together is uh, one hundred seventy two. So if minus the nineteen, we just rounded up. Yeah. I'm sorry. I said, and then I just rounded up the 19 profit to take that out. So the 155 is what we're going to be shy for this upcoming six months. And our expenses should remain steady. Or is there anything out of the ordinary coming up? Um, I do not know of anything out of the ordinary coming up. Frank and I um, are meeting tomorrow and we are going to review. We've already talked a lot about uh, the expenses, reviewed the financial statement in areas where we can um, save some money. And I believe Frank will um, have more to add to that, you know, as you guys discuss that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? We can move to the balance sheet. Item number six, Gregory. Okay, so the um, state of the school ending December 31st, when we look at our assets, the, um, the bill.com account, that's the 11,009, that is a payment that was sent to for auditing and it uh, did not reach him. So we had to reverse it and go again, that money will be spent. It is due um, to the auditor. We just had some problems with him, the check actually reaching him. Um, in your Chase account, the operating fund, we have 185000 The PayPal account has 1482 and the savings bank is 66714 for a total amount of 265000 um, In accounts receivable, we have 191000 And what that consists of is the equalization payment. Again, this is... Um, the payment that is received in January is booked into December as part of that, the charter board uh, financial statements. So 170,000 is the equalization payment that was received in January. 
And then the 21,000 is the uh, grants for the IDEA uh, program. Um, current ass assets due from state, that's the, the 50,000. So the 50,000 was received in January. I thought it was actually received December, but the cash was received in January. And then we have prepaid expenses on there for 1,789. Um, and then your fixed assets, your total fixed assets are listed there. The land is at 705, building and improvements is 3.2, furniture and equipment is 203. So your total assets is 2,682,000. Moving down the um, balance sheet to the next page, when we look at our liabilities and equities, our accounts payable is $46,000. We owe 4,200 in credit cards. Um, between our accrued payroll, unearned revenue, the, the, um, the copier leases, um, uh, it's 119,000. So our total current liabilities is 170,000. Our notes payable on the property is 1.4. And again, the, when you match up the equity at the bottom, our total net income so far for the first six months is 19,000. Any questions on any of that? That accrued payroll expense under current liabilities, the 72,000, that's rolling the payroll back that's the first payroll paid in January. We roll it back to December for the Charter Board financials. Got it. Is, I noticed one of the credit cards is one issued to our former executive director um, who left a couple months ago. It's, <clears throat> is that card still being used or I'm just curious why the balance is still... Does Dan have access to those um, credit card statements? Correct. Um, they are still using that credit card, I believe, for some Amazon purchases. And so also for um, <coughs> there are some items that are reoccurring, like the, the rent on the, the storage for the, um, the costumes. So some of the charges that are reoccurring on that credit card, we need to close the credit card and move to another one. Um, but I think it right for right now they're keeping it open for the line of credit. It is the main card. Got it. And Dan has access to those credit card statements, or do we all have access to review those? Um, we can get you. I can send them over to you if you would like to see them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But Dan, do you have access to all that mid first information now? No, I do not yet. I'm still trying to get access. Okay. I'll, I'll hopefully wrap that up or see what I need to do to take care of that this week. You're working with Jessica on that? Uh, I was working with the mid first on that, but I'll reach out to Jessica as well. Okay. Jessica might be able to, um, she might be able to help you on that. Cool. Great. Thank you. Right. Any other questions on the balance sheet? Uh, Priscilla, anything else that you want to draw to our attention? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, we've gone through the, the profit and loss on the balance sheet. Um, I know I send you guys a spreadsheet and I tried to be very descriptive on that spreadsheet. Um, I'm not sure if you guys noticed, there were a couple of counts that were questioned the last go round. So I added a couple of extra tabs there, giving you that detail all together so that if you needed it, um, if there's anything more that you're needing, any um, other accounts that you want to see the detail for, just let me know and I'll get that for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had fewer questions this time. Thank you. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Um, I do have one question and it relates to the, the CPA that we've used. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that we have a, we'll get to it in a minute. We have a outstanding request to 
authorize the next year's mm -hmm. um, audit process with a Correct. slightly increased um, cost. But I noticed in that letter, um, Brett said that the entire cost of the audit is recoverable from the state through an increased equalization mm -hmm. payment. Do you yes. know how that works and have we done that in the past? Um, yes, we make sure to, to include that. So when the um, annual financial report is sent into the state, as long as we list on there what the cost of the audit is, they add it into the equalization payment. So it's part of the calculation for the equalization payment. And where you see it, there's a report from the state called the CHAR 55, and it's listed on the CHAR 55. I believe it's on page four off to the right a little bit. You'll see the dollar amount in there. So if it's a zero, then it is not being recovered. And if there's an amount there, then it is being recovered. So it is included. And I can send you a copy of the CHAR 55 and highlight that for you so you can see where it's added in. That'd be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, well, let's just deal with that um, audit request right now. Priscilla, is there any reason why we should seek a different auditor for this upcoming financial year or fiscal year rather than continuing with Brett? Um, my recommendation would be to renew with Brett for, for two reasons. One, you just switched auditors two years ago, so you're already switching from auditor to auditor. But Brett was new to the account. He found some things that um, needed to be corrected, and we've done those corrections. Um, the first audit, as you know, was a disclaimer. The second one... Um, ended up not being. And so this next audit should be an, a good audit. And with having Brett knowing the account and knowing a little bit of the history, it helps to, to have the audit go smoothly. Um, I mean, personally, I work well with Brett. Um, we're together on a few other accounts just by chance. Um, so it, it happens to work, you know, he understands the way I work. I understand the items that he needs. So our last audit, because I, you know, we were more familiar with each other, it went very smooth. Okay. Um, so, so last year, last fiscal year, the price for his services was, uh, 13,900, I think all in, um, and we paid a $2,000 deposit, I think fairly early on, and then we paid mm -hmm. the balance at 11900 right before the final report was due. Mm -hmm. And this year, the total price is going up to 14500 I believe. Let's see, pull that up. Um, There's some auditors out there that will not even issue the final audit to the state until they've re received payment in hand. Um, when Brett first came on, he was very flexible with us by accepting payments because we were in that whole time where we needed to you know, work with our vendors. And he was very um, willing to work with us and accept payments on that first year. So, but I mean, ultimately, it's up to the board, how, whatever the board decides to do. Um, there are other audit firms out there if you wanted to uh, get some quotes and have them take a look. Yeah, I think in the context that we're in, it makes sense to continue on with Brett for the reasons you said, um, but I'm open to other thoughts. Um, Brett is asking for an answer on that quote by February 6th. We do have another board meeting on February 3rd. Um, but I, my preference would be to just take care of this now and get it squared away. Well, I know um, he has to submit a letter to the state letting him know or letting them know that you've chosen him as an audit. So there's some back end paperwork that has to be done. So that's why he's requesting um, an answer or a commitment early in the year. Yeah. And it represents a, Four percent ish increase over last year, but um, as you just explained, it's fully reimbursable from the state, so it's not really an impact on us. Um, so, with that said, I think we need uh, to give somebody authority to sign that um, quote saying that we, we accept it on behalf of the school. Um, 
Frank, is that something that you'd be up for signing? Yes, yes of course. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then I will move to give Frank Maurizio authority to sign uh, the Brett v. Bachlin CPA TC um, quote uh, for audit services for the fiscal year ending um, June 30th, 2021, in the amount of $14,500. Second. Thank you, Dan. Any other discussion? Who audits the auditor? How do we know? His, it's his funny that you asked that because um, a few years ago, they started auditing the auditors and you don't know, it's a peer group. So each auditor, their, their work papers and everything that they do is audited by um, an auditor that's selected by the state. And it could be somebody they work with. It could be somebody that they don't know at all. Um, and it's totally random. So yes, the auditors are audited by a peer. How often does that happen? And do we get feedback on that? Um, or is that posted I do or published? not know the answers to that, but I can find out. Thank you. I would be curious to know how well he's doing for us, but I wouldn't want to change right away. So I want to help to promote and sustain. Right. Any other discussion? All right. All those in favor? Okay, that is unanimous. Motion passes. All right, so that takes us to an enrollment update. I will bring up the enrollment chart so we can all look at it together. All right, so this is where things stand as of today. Um, so we can see, let me see if I can do this correctly. Oh. Ah. So this is uh, where we started. This is uh, where we are currently. And uh, this is what we budgeted for going into the school year. So um, even though our total student count is only a little bit below the budgeted amount, we have 277.4 total students against a budget of 291. Uh, where we have those students matter um, because high school students we get more money for high school students um, and we get half the credit for kindergarten students. So, you know, even though we have 35 kindergarten students against a budget of uh, 25 and um, which, and then a total of 208.5 um, K through eight students against a budget of 210.5, um, the fact that we're five students below in high school means that our um, average daily membership or ADM is actually seven below, which has a significant impact on our funding. Um, so even though it says the K through 12 count is actually just two below where we budgeted, um, the, the allocation of those students in the specific grades has an outsized impact on our budget. Um, so that's, why it's important that we boost these enrollment numbers. Um, you know, I think there's room in almost every class uh, with the possible exception of, it uh, looks like second grade, fourth grade and sixth grade, maybe at about capacity. Mr. Tanner, you can probably correct me if I'm wrong on those numbers. 
Nope, you're, you are correct. But that leaves a significant number of grades and, and the whole high school that, that could significantly improve enrollment, um, at least by a few students, in some cases, as many as eight or 10 or more. Um, so uh, moving forward, I, kn I know, Mr. Marizio, you have uh, taken some efforts to start um, advancing enrollment. Um, do you, are there any updates on that front that you care to share right now? Well, um, some of it's good news and some of it's not. We had 10, four families with 10 kids ask to enroll. The problem is, and by the way, all 10 of the kids are from Waldorf schools in Idaho, Utah, Colorado. Um, but the problem is they can't be here till February. Well, that's after the 100th day. So we would not get any funding for them. And so while we would be increasing our enrollment, it wouldn't help us for this semester at all. But 10 kids wanting to come with a Waldorf background is really good news, I think. Um, we just have to make a decision if we want to take them without getting any funding for them. And I believe um, a handful under three would require some special services. Um, is it, like, because we're virtual right now and we likely will be on February 1st, or, or whenever in February, if the numbers continue the way we are, we'll get to that in a minute. But is that, are they not, it sounds like they're not in the state yet. And I think that's, that prevents them from actually enrolling. Correct. Right? They are not. In order to enroll legally in the state of Arizona, you have to provide proof of residence. Um, I have Crystal double checking with the families. We might get lucky, and what if someone owns a house down here now while they're still living in Colorado? That's proof of residency. We have not asked that question yet. We just thought of that. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I would guess the norm is you sell your house in one state, you move down here, you find a house, then you have a residency. But I suppose it's not impossible for someone to have two. So Crystal is going to check. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know how others feel about it, but you know, I think the short-term pain of not getting funding for those 10 kids will be more than offset by the fact of growing our enrollment by 10 for the next school year. Um, you know, I, and I, I understand that, especially with special education, um, that comes with extra costs, but I don't think that's truly a a valid consideration when you're deciding whether or not to enroll someone. I think it might actually is probably something that you're not supposed to consider uh, when you're That's making accurate. an enrollment decision. There's rules about your enrollment paperwork about asking questions about that and student support services and whatnot. It's it's a huge issue. Yeah. Well, Frank, are you able to reach out to them and ask the question? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Crystal's <laughs> taking care of that in the morning. Um, LDC is discussing it right now, oh, trying to weigh the same thing that Gregory just said of, can we bite the bullet for half a semester, knowing we have a chance to roll out a red carpet to this, this group of students so that they will stay for next year. And we that's 10 new kids. I think three are high school uh, one family has four kids, uh, a private, you know, pre-K, a K, a four, and an eight, I believe. Um, so they would be here a while for us, too, if we can nab them, which would be great. Um, so we're talking about it, just like you just presented. You know, it's it's good on one hand, and it, it could be bad on another. Um, everybody recognizes the importance of of getting the enrollment, that's been the conversation. So I, I should know more. I asked them to uh, come to a consensus by next Monday's meeting. So 
I should know are more they, by then. Are they already on the waiting list? Are they included in the waiting list? Yeah, they're list? on the waiting list now. Okay. And is anyone doing exit service, um, exit surveys for the 44? Did they choose to homeschool, not want to be virtual or move or? I don't know. Are you talking about 44 kids who left us? Yes. Is anyone doing exit surveys? I'm unaware of that because I believe that happened prior to me. So I wasn't involved in that. Of course, we can do them if you uh, if you so desire. Danielle, I think Crystal's still doing those and we we have access to that information. I'm trying to remember specifically where it is, but it might be even on one of these tabs um, where it talks about like their reasons for withdrawal. And there's even a, a notes section where um, uh, Crystal will type in what they wrote on their exit survey for their specific reason of leaving if, if they had any specific comments to share. Yeah. So is this already shared with me? Uh, I think I sent the link around to everybody at our last board meeting. Okay, thank um, you. But if you, if you don't have it, just let me know and I'll send it again. All right. Um, well, let's let's keep moving. Frank, that sounds like some mixed but mostly positive news. So thank you for that. Um, and that could turn into something good. It can. Yeah. I mean, if we can keep getting wins like that, that adds up over time. All right. So Priscilla, let's turn back to you for a minute. Um, if you're, oh, she, it's like she disconnect. Oh no, there you are. I just couldn't yeah. find it. <laughs> um, so we had asked you, like right when the Congress passed the law on making companies eligible for a second round of paycheck protection program loans. And your initial response was, well, you have to have a 25% year over year decline in revenue in any given quarter. And at least in the first three quarters of 2020, we couldn't show that. I think you were still working on the fourth quarter, have you, or did you already do that? And um, I thought that I sent you all of the quarters, but let me take a second look. Because I do not believe that you qualify having that 25% reduction. Um, but I continue to get questions. So, um, if they want to, yeah, I've looked at all four quarters and um, there is not a reduction in any quarter. So, um, all right. Well, look at, the, at, the, at the one quarter, but yeah, they were requesting that um, to continue to request. Um, I had four people ask me, do we qualify? Do we qualify? And I'm like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but if you want to apply, apply and let the bank tell you no. So um, that that's my recommendation at this point is if there, because there's some belief out there that you do qualify. So if that's the case, then, you know, try it. You know, like Frank says, you can't win the lotto if you don't play. So. Um, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. For still up, the, the losses that, are expected for us to apply again. Is that including the 400,000 that we got in the first? Cause that really wasn't, that was a gift. That wasn't ours. If we didn't have that 400,000, we would have continued having losses, correct? I understand what you're saying, but I'm not quite sure how the bank's going to look at that. And that's why I said apply and let them and let them make that determination because I don't believe that um, they will pull out that money for calculations. They might, they might move it from one quarter to another because again, we booked it when it was achieved, when the actual circumstance was met for us to have the forgiveness. That's when we booked the forgiveness. If you book it in a different quarter, it could swing the quarters. And that could be the argument with the bank. And that's why I kind of said, 
apply, let the banks tell you. The only other piece I would add to that um, is the the myths and legends that you've heard of the all of the monies that went out federally the first round were not enough people claimed them and there was money left over. Mm -hmm. And 100%. if we put in, even though we may be 3% short or 6% short, they may say, well, this is the last school on the list and I still have all this money and we could get lucky and get it that way. Um, I, I don't think it would hurt to apply other than the yeah. time it would take us. Um, a roll of the dice might be worth it as it really could bolster us for next year to do some things that all of you had had told me as as executive director, we want, really want to see this come back and we want to mm -hmm. see this come back and we want to add that staff. And well, those things won't happen without some of this uh, money, I believe. Right. Am I right saying that, Priscilla? Right. And that's why I said at that point, because... You could argue it with the bank. You could prove or show to the bank, you know, different things. They may, depending upon the banker you get, depending, you know, I, I agree. There could be different circumstances that they'll look at it. But everything that I'm reading without that 25 reduction, you will not qualify. But again, you know, they could make exceptions. You never know. I, I agree. Apply and let the bank tell you no. That's kind of the way I was raised. You can always ask. The worst you get is a no. Yeah, I, I think it's worth having the conversation. Um, and mid first was our lender the first time around. Mm -hmm. um, so, Dan, I think you've been in touch with that banker who handled that for us, actually. So, could you follow up with him and see, you know, what their requirements are, and sure. see about working through that application process? I did do some preliminary investigation and I think it was based, I needed some financial statements that probably weren't ready yet because the year hadn't ended yet that, that are probably ready now. So I think I can probably move forward and reach out to you, Priscilla, if I do need any information. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or you can have the banker contact either. You can let me know what they need or have the banker contact me because I don't know if they need the financial statements by quarter or by six months annual. So just let me know. Okay, cool. Thanks. And then if there's a way to clarify, they may pay out the funds, but perhaps because we, if we don't prove for the decline, the 25% decline, we may just end up having to repay that. I would clarify right. that clause. Yes, I read so We that may still well. obtain the funds, but it might be just the payback feature that yeah. we may not. Mm -hmm. That's happening in other places as well, where they yeah. took monies, borrowed it, and then they're like, okay, well, you don't qualify, so you need to get that back. And mm -hmm. So we make sure we're not put in that situation as well. Yeah. But worth finding out, I think. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, anything else related to cash flow, profit and loss, the balance sheet? Okay, um, all right, uh, Mr. Marizio, let's uh, turn it over to you for a brief in the field update about what's what's going on at the school. Well, as you know, we've transitioned to uh, pretty much the entire school being online. It has not been easy um, getting first graders, second graders, third graders on a device every morning can be challenging. Um, for parents at home, as well as us in the on-site program, um, it's, it's just tough when they are that young. Um, we've had some technical difficulties and had to call Fruth out a couple of times now uh, to work on our Wi-Fi connections, a couple of computers that uh, needed some tweaks to it. Um, you know, one day all 24 kids are accessible on Zoom, and the next day only nine can get on, and we don't know why. Fruth is still working on that with us. Um, so it has not been perfect, although I will say it's been better. Each day we resolve another problem and fix it for, you know, 10 more kids or 15 more kids. Um, and I don't know if you've been getting emails or phone calls. Um, I have not. The teachers have. 
um, because that's who they call first, of, of course, say, hey, my kid can't get on. So we have had some difficulties with Zoom. That's topic one. Um, topic two, we found out the window for the test dates of um, AZ Merit. And as you know, it is going to be third through 10th, I think, testing. And our problem is we were happy to hear that, okay, you were chosen to be on a computer. But they made a rule that is going to be a little bit of a challenge, and that is all testing has to be in person. So every kid's going to have to come to school and test on a computer. That presents a couple of problems for us. Problem one, today we don't have enough computers for all of our kids because we've been relying on kids using computers from home and not taking a computer from us. And you cannot use a computer from home for the test site. It has to be a school computer. Uh, the rule is there, of course, as you can imagine, so that nobody's mom takes the test for them. <laughs> They're good, the kids are going to be supervised by the teacher in the room. That's problem number one. Problem number two, I'm imagining, and we have a lot of questions into uh, ADE. Uh, Deb Paolo and Miss Cummings have been working on that for me. Uh, uh, the second question is, well, first question is, can they get us computers? Can, can we rent them cheaply? We don't know. We're trying to figure that out. Number two is, what do we do with a parent who says, no, I'm not sending my kid to school. I, I don't trust it right now. He's not coming back. How do we deal with that? Is that okay? Is it not okay? Mm. Question number three, we can solve it's just going to be a challenge, like when you look in um, in a, a sixth grade classroom where there's 26 kids. We can't, by social distancing rules, put all 26 next to each other and take the test. So we're going to have to split that class into 13s and utilize our specialty teachers, our first and second grade teachers who are not testing into proctoring when we sp split those classes because we're gonna have to make some promises about mask wearing and uh, social distancing to bring these kids back. If indeed at that time of year, we're still under these type of rules um, with the metrics. I knock on wood, am hopeful that by spring break, things will change, but we have to plan for the worst right now. And so those are three big questions that we're all brainstorming to try and come up with answers for. Any comments on that, anybody? Do, do the tests have to be done all over one day or can it be spread across multiple days? I, I believe, and John, I'm trying to remember, is it a two week window or a one week window? Two weeks. It's a two week window. So we can spread them out a little bit. Um, so we're not bringing the whole school in on the same day is the idea. Maybe we bring in fourth, sixth and eighth to test. By the way, the high school won't be a problem. We won't have to split classes there because I think the most we have in a class is 11. Right. So um, they could test their kids by themselves in one room and still social distance. It's the grades where we have over 20 in a class that we'd want to split. So in theory, couldn't you do one class a day on 30 computers? That's what we're doing the math on right now. We're working that up to see. Um, I don't think we can do one. A, right. It's yeah. going to have to be three minimum a day to do. Um, and remember, we try and calculate this, but... We have families with three kids. Do we really want to tell them, okay, this kid comes in on Tuesday. This kid comes in on Thursday. We want to try and avoid that if it's possible. I'm not even saying it is, but I want to give some thought to that uh, for families. 
Hey, bro, are you have... doing okay? With yes, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> I I uh, unmuted myself to ask a question and forgot to mute myself back when I was typing. Sorry about that. Um, you said, Frank, you said the testing dates are the 3rd through the 10th, and that's March. Is that is that accurate? Is that what you said? No, it's it's in the 20s, correct, John? I want to say it's March 20th to 29th or something like that. I, oh, okay. I'll send them to you tomorrow. I, I don't remember okay. it being that early in March. Do you, John? I thought it was the end. I, I wrote on my calendar that it was that it starts on um, March 29th. And that was what was written on the school calendar. I but I thought I is, had heard I you say. that is correct. To April 9th. I think that is correct. Oh, to April 9th. Okay. Okay, I just, I because you were talking about spring break, and I was like, those dates are during spring break, and like, we no, wouldn't no, want to no. ask families to come in, no, but I, I was confused my the memory. Dates, it's so. the 29th to the 9th, that's correct. 29th through the 9th, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. In regards to issues with the computers or the internet, are teachers allowed to have a backup plan, like whether or not the parent or the child does a log that they turn in so that it counts as a attendance versus having to be on a screen that works or doesn't work? Well, I would tell like you, I get, those, I get those phone calls and I certainly am taking the stance as we muddle through this, that I am not going to lean on the side of, I'm sorry, I'm holding the hard line. That's an absence and two more and you're out. I'm not doing that. That would be ridiculous. I need to work with these families, especially when it could be our fault because of the Wi-Fi and the Zoom coming from our classroom. So I've talked through that with a couple of families and they're not falling apart once I talk through it with them. Their biggest concern is you're going to kick my kid out. And my answer is, no, I'm not going to do that over this. Please just keep trying to come on. We're working on it on our end. Um, I just think that's the right stance to take. But is that an option? Like if a student was logging in the time they spend on a certain project or signed off by a parent, if they aren't able to log in or don't want to log in? Um, I, I don't believe it, it has been talked about as an option as we want them online. We want them on as much as possible, but we aren't necessarily holding it against them when the anxiety causes them to not finish that last hour and a half during the day. Um, the parent usually calls the teacher and explains that to them. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm answering the question that you're asking. Um, uh, we're trying not to hold the kid accountable on the negative is, is the answer. And it may just be a communication with the teacher to see if that's, if that's allowed or wanted. And, and, and some teachers are, are making what they feel are the right decisions at the time to help what's best for the kid. And I think that's the way we should let that be is let those teachers lean on the side of the kids. Great. Thank you. And the other end with the testing, um, is, has anyone asked if there's an exemption, if there's a way around that rule? I mean, we've been able to get creative in the past. Is there something we can do about that since they're in person anyway? Well, we actually got an answer back today on our most pressing answer. We asked, can we switch to paper? And the answer was a flat out, no, you may not switch to paper. You must do it on computer. Um, have we communicated with any other um, Waldorf schools or other schools, um, what their thoughts are or how they're handling it? Have we collaborated at all? Well, I have some good news there. I have reached out to the four schools in Arizona for some other reasons, like should we join the same insurance plan together? Should we uh, um, collaborate on those type of issues in order to bring prices down for us? And they're all in dialogue with me. Uh, it's three ladies and one lady runs two schools. I didn't know that. She actually runs two campuses. Um, but this will be probably the next topic is how are you dealing with uh, AZ Merit? I will tell you, one of the schools only has like 12 kids. So I'm not foreseeing that that is a problem for that site. They only, they said they had four teachers total. So they're in a little different situation than we are. I think we're still the biggest Waldorf school in Arizona by far, I think. So 
the computer issue is something we need to work out. And I've got lots of minds sitting down and talking about it. I'm sure we'll come up with a solution. I've kind of given a date of, I would like to have a plan in place by the time we get back from spring break. So we have three weeks to tweak something if we need to. Uh, We've reached out to uh, the George Gervin School to see if they would let us use their computer lab. And their answer was, well, we're using it then. We're in the same window you are. So I'm sorry, it's not available. And I certainly understand that. I mean, so we're thinking outside the box here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure I, I talked about this in an email to you guys, but the ESSER funds, and I know Jessica, if uh, Priscilla, if you're still on the line, the ESSER funds were a part of the grant to help get campuses in shape for COVID. And we use some of those funds to hire an extra custodian to be a sanitizer all day long. Well, those funds are exhausted now. There is no funds left. So every day we keep him, that comes out of our regular budget. Uh, We still have a nighttime custodian who cleans. Uh, This other custodian works during the day and kind of follows the kids around at the washing stations and the bathrooms and wipes up just to make sure we're being extra safe. Um, But uh, Priscilla was able to share with me that that's about 2,500 bucks a month that we're going to put out the rest of the year out of the budget. If you think that is worth it to keep doing, okay. Uh, It's not harmful. It helps to keep the place clean, but I want to make sure you know the budget implication there of 2,500 a month. Is that something that while we're virtual is still going on? Can we pause it until in-class instruction resumes? That's a good suggestion. As a matter of fact, with only 25 kids on campus, I probably could get uh, Hector or Steve to wipe down the areas that they're using um, because it's limited. It it doesn't need what we had when we had lots of kids on campus. That's actually a good idea. I'm sure we can. Um, I guess I'm just looking for a a direction from you to say, yay, do all of it, do half of it, keep it the way it is. I'm fine with all three. I just want to point out the budget implication. That's all. It's, uh, I mean, this brings into sharp relief uh, the tension between trying to do everything you can to keep it as safe as you can and the ability to to do it with the funding we have. Um, I I think for now, let's see if we can pause it and see if Hector and Steve can can do it until we're back mostly in person or at least back to hybrid. And then, you know, hopefully over the next couple of months, um, we'll have made some progress on a fundraising plan, and uh, with any luck, we'll we'll see some donations coming in the door uh, that maybe will help offset some of these costs for the last part of the school year. I do have a question on that. Do we have a contract with that company for a, a lot of time, or is it a month-to-month basis? I mean, can I even pursue calling him and saying, "Hey, we want to pause." Um, Frank, I'll be on site tomorrow, so I'll pull all those invoices and we can take a look. I'm not sure if Christy signed a contract when she did, um, when she hired them, but I'll pull all the invoices and we'll take a look and see if we can get on the phone with them and and negotiate something. Okay. Thank you. Any other thoughts on that front, Mr. Tanner? If, If we put it on pause... Will we have to ch- rewrite our mitigation plan? Is that in the mitigation plan? That's part of the question, yes. Yeah, that's that's a good question. What, let's, let's see if I can pull it up quickly. Remember, if we have somebody else on our campus doing it, 
it's still getting done. It doesn't matter who does it, does it? <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Yeah, that's that's true. How many classrooms is that happening in? All of them? This person's doing all of them? No, um, they were doing all of them while everyone was on campus. But right now, they're just doing the ones that the on-site kids are in. Um, John, is that correct to say you're in your room by yourself right now? Is anyone coming in there and sanitizing while you're just in there? That's to my recollection. Yeah, I think he's just focusing on the areas where the kids are right now. Used. Yeah. And about how many is that? How many rooms? Uh, four. Early childhood. The one twos are in the eurythmic room. The three fives are in fifth grade. And seven, eight is in seventh grade. So four. And I'm sorry, the high school, they have three students. Uh, typically, two of them are in a room by themselves, and one is with a, a teacher by himself. Yeah, I'm looking at our mitigation plan, and it says how we're going to clean the restroom facilities. Um, it says a Cleaning crews will also spray bathroom facilities with a certain kind of spray at the end of each day. Um, but We're doing that because we yeah. have the night person comes in at like one o'clock. So she okay. starts working on that right away. And, and that's separate than the plan B or is that plan B? Plan B is the day porter who's there kind of helping out during the day, right? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, it doesn't even look like we're, we have that in our mitigation plan right now. So that's above and beyond what we've promised. Okay. I, I believe. Um, so, yeah, if there's a way we can pause it and see where we are in a month or two, I think that's ideal, depending on how that conversation goes. Um, you know, and it, what, what I don't want to do is get in a situation where we've had relatively low spread. We've had, I don't think any spread that's been identified as originating from our school. Um, and I, you know, it's hard to know the causal relationship between the things we have in place and that lack of spread. We've had cases, but they seem to be coming from outside the school and coming in. I would hate to give up a protection we put in place and then find out, well, that was actually, that was, that's what was, you know, protecting you guys the most. I, I, my suspicion is that this is not what's doing it based on what I know about COVID, but, um, and if we can not spend an extra $12,000 roughly through the end of the year, I think that would be great. And it, it also doesn't seem to be something that we've, we promised people that we're going to do. So I think we have some discretion here. And Frank's able to make that decision, right? Yeah, I'll talk through with Priscilla tomorrow and we'll call the company and see if it's even possible. I mean, if we have a contract, we certainly don't want to break a contract. I wouldn't want to do that. I don't know about you guys, but if there is no contract, we would explain our situation. Hey, we went from 280 kids being on campus to... 21 is our, our situation changed. Yeah. Mr. Tanner, did you have something else to add? I think you were. Yeah. My, my, my machine uh, went out. So you still have a fair amount of adults that are coming to the school during the day. 
So I, just to be mindful of that. And I don't know that the, that the, maybe that maybe the thing to do or take a look at is, is to cut back on the night crew. I mean, what you might save more money there. What do you, what do you really need them for? I mean, Juan's a guy who's going around keeping the place clean during the day. Just a thought. John makes a point. The night person's main job is to clean a classroom, meaning vacuum, empty garbage, wipe down. Well, we only have four classrooms being utilized that are getting messy with kids in them. So it's not like that most of that person's job. Now, I will say they still clean the front offices and early childhood and the downstairs in the office because that gets utilized for meetings and stuff. So she is cleaning those things, but maybe that doesn't need to be an eight hour shift. Maybe that's where we can reduce. Yeah. I think it's worth exploring all the options, but I think ultimately, however you shake it out, it's going to be consistent with what we've told people we're going to do. Um, so I think you have discretion to figure out the best financial value for us on this front. Okay. All right. I'll talk with uh, Priscilla tomorrow and I'll get back to you uh, before the weekends I'm on a decision. Right. I'm uh, it, it, anything else on, on the operational front that you want to share with us? Um, well, I, I told you uh, we're talking the LDC and now I've involved some of the other Waldorf schools uh, to see if we can get a better deal on health insurance. I'm concerned that we may have a broker sit down with us and say it's going to be a 20% increase. We can't we don't want to do that. That's a bad deal for everybody. So I'm trying to be proactive and, and get some ideas ahead of time on that. Um, that's all. Okay. I have lots of meetings set up next week. We have a full staff meeting again. Uh, the first one I have was only three minutes to introduce myself. This one will be a little bit longer. The staff has been asking, can we meet? Can we meet? And so we're going to do that. Um, I have spent a lot of time with individual teachers. And again, I'll brag what wonderful people we have. I've been in classrooms. Uh, they treat kids marvelously. Uh, we're very lucky. Very good. Thank you. Yep. So let's move on to uh, COVID-19 issues. We've touched on some of this with the cleaning already, but let me just give a quick update on where the metric stand, uh, since that's what is determining our current status of virtual learning only with on-site support services. Um, so this is the most recent data we have. It's now almost a week old. This is from January 14th. We'll update tomorrow morning. Um, but the recommended delivery model is still virtual. All right. To, um, we want all of these to be in the yellow, uh, or, or at least one of them to be in the yellow, I think, before we can uh, start, before the state will start switching its recommended delivery model um, to uh, hybrid, at least. So we're still sitting quite a bit above these yellow lines. So, you know, we're uh, cases per 100,000, you know, we're not even close. We've got you know, 860 and we need to be below 100 for percent positivity. We're also way more than double. We're at 23.9%. We want to be 10% or below. And the hospital visits um, are ticking down. Um, we'll see if that holds. You can see the date on this data is December 27th, uh, which means that this doesn't include yet the effects of um, really of Christmas and New Year's gatherings that may have occurred. So there's a two week lag. So what I think we can expect to see is probably a little bit of a spike over the next couple of weeks of data that come in and then it will start to taper off. Um, if you look at the 
I think the New York Times has a graph that's a little bit more updated in terms of cases that come in. You can, it looks like Arizona is finally starting to come down, at least on the number of cases. Um, so actually what we can do is take a look at the general COVID-19 dashboard. And we're testing. And so you can kind of start to see that here where it, it looks like over the last week or so, things are finally starting to, to taper off. We'll see if that holds. Um, but you can see that the percent positivity is not really dropping, which isn't a great sign. So it, it looks like we're gonna be in this virtual learning model um, for a, at least a few more weeks. Um, I'm, like Frank, I'm hoping <laughs> earnestly uh, that we get back to hybrid sooner than later. Um, but right now the data just is not supporting that and the state is not recommending it. Uh, the state's recommendation for Maricopa County is what we've agreed to follow. Um, in other news, um, on January 11th, all of our faculty and staff became eligible to receive a vaccine. Um, I understand, uh, Frank, that you've made the ID cards, school ID cards that they'll need in order to obtain that vaccine. Uh, so that's all excellent news. Um, so two things on that front. One, the board members are also eligible, as I understand it, um, to receive the vaccine. So, but we don't have, you know, ID cards. Um, is that something that you could quickly create for us? Yes. If you send me a photo of you, any picture of you, uh, um, Tammy in the front office, we have a laminating machine and she was a whiz. She made them in one day. So if the five of you send me a, just a picture, um, we'll put it together for you. Hopefully I can have it by, by Monday morning, if not Friday afternoon. Brilliant. Appointments they're scheduling right now are for Friday and Saturday. So the sooner the better. <laughs> yeah, my appointment's tomorrow. So. <laughs> okay. um, all right, and then the second question I guess is, is there a general sense among faculty and staff without talking about particulars um, is there a strong push for people obtaining the vaccine? Is this, or is there resistance to it? Um, I'm just kind of curious where we stand from a vaccination level potential among faculty and staff. Well, um, while I don't know everyone's political affiliation, it seems like we are a subset of the rest of America. We got half who are gung-ho and have already signed up. And we have half who are saying, uh, this isn't mandatory, is it? <laughs> so it is what it is. Um, of course, it's not mandatory. We, we can't force anyone to do that. And I've answered that that way. No, this is for your information. If you'd like to do that, we're trying to make it easy for you by guiding you. Um, John, am, am I wrong in saying that, or do you have a, a different take? I think you spoke accurately. Okay. Uh, I haven't taken any straw poll. Desert Marigolds and Waldorf Education typically has been anti-vax in general, but this is another circumstance. So yeah. I'd have to do more research on that. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's, it's complicated for many reasons, even for people who may be gung-ho in theory about it, but have reservations about mm -hmm. this one in particular. Um, all right, well, I think that makes it hard then to say, I don't know that that changes the calculus for us deviating from the state's recommendation to stay virtual only. I think it would, might conceptually look different if it was, okay, everybody's 
been vaccinated. So at least from a faculty and staff perspective, um, you know, there, there's a safety consideration that's been met there. And if individual parents and kids, you know, want to make a di their own decision, then we can leave that up to them. I, I don't know that, you know, when we're at a 50-50 split on it, like the rest of America is, um, that it changes our risk calculus very much. I, I'm open to other thoughts. This is me just kind of talking it through the information. It should always be the individual's choice. And I, I think that should be a private matter for those. And it doesn't turn into a, a discrimination issue or we're all starting to wear scarlet letters. I agree with that sentiment, but I also um, appreciate what Frank said initially. He talked about how, you know, he, he it's not mandatory, but we want to make it accessible and easy for them if they choose to get it. Um, so I would encourage any sort of information coming, um, you know, from the school that's just informative, you know, that with with links to things like the benchmarks, information about the vaccine, um, information about how to sign up, you know, things of that nature so that it's readily available and at our fingertips. Um, I think that would be helpful because I know previously, um, you know, what John Tanner said is, is certainly accurate. We, we have a high, um, high amount of uh, families who choose not to vaccinate. Um, and we had the great whooping cough epidemic <laughs> years ago. Um, we're just about everybody came down with whooping cough, including my children. Um, and we were on NPR, like it, it was a big deal. Um, so I think some education would would certainly help just to just to put it at people's fingertips so that if they want to research, they can research and it's it's easily and readily available to them. And April, so you know that um, Gregory's been sending me some of those uh, informative updates, and I just passed them on with, a, like you said, FYI, this is the latest information. It, it's for you to read. I don't say go do this. I just put it in their hands for them to make a decision. I think that's great. I, I think we should do that with the community as well. So maybe forwarding those out on, on Parent Square just, just to put the information out there with the pro appropriate links. Because maybe they you know, that maybe we've got a multi-generational household and, and they gotta sign up, you know, the grandma who's in the house, who's who's at home right now, making sure that the kids get online. Maybe we need to get her signed up and you know, parents are working and they're busy and they don't have time to look for that information. If we can put it in their hands, I think that would be helpful. By the way, since you mentioned Parent View, if you didn't notice, I sent out a message today um, just reminding everyone it's tax season. And if you want to make your uh, tax credit donation to Desert Marigold, we welcome it with open arms. Just a friendly reminder. That's all I sent. All right. Uh, anything else on COVID related issues? Okay, uh, so let's move on to the community topic of our agenda. Uh, so I am, I have not made much progress on advancing that. Uh, I just didn't have time the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to uh, continue uh, <laughs> Uh, trying to reach out to folks and get this community contemplation exercise off the ground. Um, I, I know all the people I need to get in touch with. I just didn't have time to do it. So I'm going to get that going in the next couple of weeks. Um, more um, substantively, uh, I think we should tonight schedule a town hall meeting for the community. Um, People have been asking for a live interactive experience with uh, the board and the administration um, and would like the ability to ask questions and have them answered without a filter. And I 100% agree with that. And now that a lot of our um, crises are under control and being well managed, um, I think we ought to try to plan for that. Um, 
So to me, it makes sense to have Frank, if you're available for something like that, um, and then have a couple board members, I'll participate. And I was hoping someone else could volunteer. Danielle, okay, very good. Um, oh, April, were you raising your hand too? I did it previously, but I, I'm, I'll be the uh, alternate. Okay. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> okay. All right. So Frank, me, and Danielle will do it this time around. Um, is it, uh, I think doing it on a Saturday would make the most sense so that most, will be the most available for parents um, rather than doing it on a, Workday evening or or something like that. It, it, does that work for you, Frank? I don't want to tell you. Yeah, okay. I would just want to know a couple of weeks advance. So, I, like like this Saturday, I'm getting my vaccine. So that would be the wrong Saturday to do that. But I yeah. want to know a couple of weeks in advance. That's all. So if we said the Saturday the thirtieth, would that be far enough away? It's not week. quite two weeks. Will you repeat the date? I just went to grab my schedule. Saturday the 30th. Are you what? looking at a night or a morning? What are you thinking? Uh, like a 10 a.m. is what I'm thinking. Okay. But actually, now that I'm saying this out loud... Um, what would you want to use as the facility? So I think we, what we do is we'd schedule a um, a webinar like this one, and then you know, kind of one by one, we could promote people to presenter and have them ask a question live, and then the three of us could answer it in an interactive way, um, and then put them back to a participant, and then take the next question and go for. An hour. Well, you want to do it on Zoom, not in person. I, I do. I, I think we should try and be consistent with the all the safety stuff we put in place. So let me. January thirtieth is a workable date for me. Me too. After proposing it, I realize I actually have a, a conflict that day. Um, so how about February 6th? No. No? So not during the week? I don't want to push it too far out either. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the next Saturday that will work. 23rd is too soon. 30th, I have a conflict. So does the six work for the two of you or no? The six works for me. Okay. I'm not available. Ah, okay. Um, What about the alternate? <laughs> oh, what time were we suggesting? It's like 10 a.m., just a, a mid-morning. I would be, I'd be, I'd be available after 2.30 p.m., but not before that, on Saturday, February 6th. Okay, so why don't we, does Saturday night, ugh, Saturday afternoon work for you, Frank? Sure. Like, say, 3 o'clock? Okay. And with the webinar, do we know what our capacity is or how many we can welcome in? It, Has it, that been tested? Uh, it fits up to 100 people. Okay. How high have we gotten? I think we've had 50 um, at the, the very beginning of the pandemic and the first time the, the school went to virtual only learning. Um, typically we have 20, 30 uh, attendees for our board meetings. 
So it, I think it should more than accommodate this. And uh, you know, if, if there's not room, then I think we schedule another one and you know, try and do it again. Or you know, I, I, that's a good problem to have too much engagement. So <laughs> you know, if that's the problem, we'll figure it out and we'll and we'll add more capacity. Okay, so let's let's plan for February sixth town hall at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we'll plan to go for an hour, and we'll just take open questions from the community. It's, it's meant to be a dialogue, I think. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, and then in the meantime, uh, Dan, you had proposed having a, a dynamic kind of FAQ that we could. Yeah. So when there's these kind of town halls, or these community meetings, like a lot of times uh, what we do in like when there's 300 people in the meeting and you can't have everybody this kind of talking at the same time. You either do something similar to how you said, where you let people in, ask a question, let people in. But something that we kind of found was really, really effective was like letting anyone write down questions on like, a, it's called an idea board or different things, but write, write, write down questions on there. And then everyone in the community can vote on those questions. And then you just kind of address the highest voted questions in order um, until you run out of time. And then you can even say, we'll, we'll address the remaining questions, uh, you know, offline because we want to make sure everyone's voice is heard. But then a lot of times people have the same question, like 10 people might have the same question, just worded slightly differently. And you can say, oh, this is all the, kind of the same thing. But you typically need like a moderator to group the questions as well. So there have to be someone kind of online. You know, I'm, I'm looking at the chat comments and somebody typed in, that we can have uh, people submit questions in advance so that we can figure mm -hmm. out who, I have 12 of this question and eight of this question. Um, and that also would be, give us an idea how many people would be coming or might be coming. Thank you, Larry, yeah. for saying that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, all, all good ideas. So. I, I'm skeptical about my personal ability to get that kind of what you're describing, Dan, up and running in time for maybe next time or something. Yeah, that's kind yeah. of that too. I, I like that the idea of it conceptually, so we're not repeating ourselves, and you know, there's engagement going on during the you know webinar that's not just listening to us talk. Um, it, I also like the idea of being able to take the answers to those questions, you know, you know, figure out what are the most pressing questions that are being upvoted and then take answers to those and be able to send out an email that answers them to everybody who wasn't able to attend. Yeah. But maybe next time we could, could we, we, we want to do like a practice by ourselves and have a moderator and iron the kinks out and it would take a little bit of time. Yeah. Plus that most of those products require some level of licensing, though they do have education packages that are deeply discounted, like $6 a year or something crazy or $20 a uh, year. Okay. Let's, uh, let's keep that on the, on the back burner for now. See if we can figure that out for future events. All right. So that brings us to our last category for the evening or board procedural issues. Uh, so we need to approve our minutes in the last board meeting. I will move to approve the minutes of our January 6th, 2020 board meeting. Second. Thank you, Danielle. 2021. 2021, thank you. <laughs> I misspoke, 2021. Um, all right. Thank you, Danielle, for seconding. Any other discussion? All right, all those in favor? It's unanimous. All right, then 
The next topic in this category, uh, any final action needed to address results of the Arizona State Board of Charter Schools five-year interval review. Um, I, those are due tomorrow. Um, I submitted today, uh, this morning at about nine o'clock, the last piece of it for um, the, the, basically like 10 years ago, we added a piece of property to our campus. Um, and for whatever reason, we didn't notify the charter board about that, or they didn't get notice anyway. So they needed a formal amendment to make it clear that that piece of property where the high school sits is part of our, actually part of our campus and that we're using it and for what purpose. And um, so I submitted all of that today, so that's done. And then I think the only other piece was um, a small issue with the enrollment documentation about any fees we charge students. I think that's basically a statement saying we don't charge yeah, students. So we've taken Is care of that, true? Gregory. Uh, Crystal has changed it and submitted it to uh, to Mary. Is that her name? Mary, Mary yeah. And I did reach out to Mary okay, very good. after your email to see what is the next step, because I understand there's another phase now. Yeah, I think they look at everything we sent and then they figure out if we've brought everything into compliance that they identified and then they would issue a revised compliance report and update our performance dashboard. So I, I don't think it's super involved right now, but if Mary says something different, uh, let us know. I will. All right. Uh, so that brings us to uh, our board calendar. So April, do you want to talk us through issues there? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I believe I sent that out to everybody um, before the last meeting. Um, and I will try to continue to um, put in a shortcut, which is apparently a thing you can do, <laughs> um, into our meeting documents so everyone can, can have it at the ready. Um, the one thing that I wanted to bring forward is we've had discussions the entire time I've been on the board about having some board education at board meetings. And Liz Bevan has sort of been on the back burner, um, patiently waiting for us to kind of put out all of our fires and, and come speak to us. Um, and I did give her our next two meeting dates, the 3rd and the 17th of um, February. I would prefer to have her come on the 3rd simply because that's generally our shorter meeting. Um, so if no one has any uh, issues with that, I will go ahead and, and confirm that date with her to come speak to us for just, you know, 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Um, and I believe the topic that she wanted to talk to us about was, um, um, oh my gosh, I'm tired. Um, meshing Waldorf with, with virtual education. I believe that was what she was going to talk to us about. But if there's anything specific um, Frank, in particular, if you have anything in mind that you would like to learn from Liz Bevan, um, feel free to reach out to me and I can check in with her and say, hey, can you touch on this topic as well or instead of? Um, but I'm excited to have her finally come, <laughs> not have to send her another email and say, sorry, please wait another six months. Um, other than that, um, just pay attention to these dates. Everything is up to date. Um as well as the notes on the cover page about like, um, you know, just our finances and the, the, our budget process. Um, I think that's it regarding the calendar. Yeah, I agree with you. Let's have her come on February 3rd since we usually do budget stuff mid month. Uh, so we should have a little bit more time. Okay. And I did look through the financial information. It looks like um, it's accurate. Um, Priscilla, the one thing I still need from you is the 
Q4 quarterly reports. I, I don't know that I've seen that yet. That's something I need to send to RSF by the end of this month. Are they looking for just quarter four or the first six months? Uh, just the fourth quarter. So every 30 days after the end of every quarter, they want the prior, that most recent quarters, you know, profit and loss, balance sheet, that, that kind of stuff. Okay. So the ones that I sent you, is that what they're needing or they want just the quarter? Are they looking for only... So are they, the ones that I sent you are July through December. Are they looking for October to December or? Yeah, j just that three month window, I believe. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, All right, so that brings us uh, to our last topic for the night, which is board member growth. Uh, we're, a, we're a small group. Uh, we've done an incredible amount of stuff uh, already, even with the two new members who joined us back in November. But we could use more help. Uh, so I'd like to you know, ask everybody in this call, Frank and Priscilla included, you know, if you know people who would be good additions uh, to our board, who have skills, um, who would be valuable, um, you know, I think we could really use uh, some extra hands uh, on a variety of fronts. So it, it would be really nice if we could get our board back up to, you know, seven, nine, ten people, uh, eleven. Uh, I think is our max. That would be fantastic. Uh, it just makes things a lot easier when you can have lots of different projects going and one or two people working on all of them and reporting back versus having the, the few of us trying to do everything. Um, I'm super impressed with what we've accomplished, but it is uh, it is a lot to ask of a volunteer board. So if you know of anyone, anyone watching, if you know of anyone, if you think, hey, this board isn't getting this issue, I could help. I could have a voice in that. I could, you know, I could help the school grow. Um, our applications uh, are due, let's see, it's probably on the calendar, isn't it? Um, I can answer that. They're on, they're due on April 1st. On April 1st. And that's on the proposed timeline that, that I sent out. Got it. Yeah, so due on April 1st. Um, and then the, we would do a round of interviews, and then actual elections would be in May. So it, please, you know, if you know of someone, encourage them to come to a couple of our board meetings this semester, uh, because that is one of the requirements before you're elected, is that you have attended two of our board meetings. and. It, it, right now, it is the easiest time uh, it's ever been to attend our board meetings since they're all on Zoom and you literally click a button and here you are. Um, so, you know, please, we could really use the help. Um, it, we really appreciate, you know, all the different segments of the community that we have and different resources. Everybody has connections. Uh, you know, we'd love to have outside expertise that doesn't, you know, if they have a relationship with the school, that'd be great. But a lot of the times if we can get some experts in their fields, um, that's also extremely helpful. So, all right. Any other thoughts on growing our board? Um, I just wanted to share some thoughts. I'm not sure who looked over um, that item. I, I can't remember if, um, Gregory, if you sent out the link to that, um, to the meeting documents folder, if we were just talking about it and we didn't send it out. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I did, I know there, there, I talked to so many people and then I forget, did I actually put this out to the masses? 
Um, but Gregory and I have been discussing um, just some action items on on ways that we can um, improve communication to not only staff and faculty, but to our community as well to reach out to them and, and um, you know, s- seek out their skills, seek out their help, um, let them know what we are looking for, what um, areas we struggle with, um, and and how we think we can all, you know, work together and be united in, in bringing our school forward. Um, so we'll be reaching out to staff and faculty and the community and the survey will go out. Um, we really want everyone to be involved um, in finding the people, you know, if, if, if your best friend has the greatest ideas, recommend that they apply to the board. Um, you know, I, I'm, I applied to the board because people asked me, people said, why aren't you on the board? And because I attended meetings and I realized I had some of the answers to the questions that were being posed. And I'm sure that many people watching these board meetings are in the same position. Um, so it, it never hurts to try. Um, we could certainly use your help. Um, and everyone is valuable. Maybe you can't serve on the board right now, but maybe you can help in some other capacity. Maybe you could, um, you know, help behind the scenes or, or join in on some of the fundraiser activities that will be forthcoming. Um, so we, we really just want to get the word out there um, ahead of time and just get people excited about it because we're a great school and we're ready to move forward and we want your help. You're important to us. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our meeting tonight, then. I will move to adjourn. Second. Thank you, Dan. Um, Any other discussion? All right, all those in favor? All right. April, could you read the closing verse? Yes. The most important tasks for humankind today and in the future is that we should learn to live together and understand one another. If this human fellowship is not achieved, all talk of development is empty. By Rudolf Steiner. All right. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for being here and for your time and for your passion for the school. It's much appreciated. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night, everybody.